Every year they come from all over Vermont, from the smaller towns and the larger cities. Some of them farmers, some of them lawyers, doctors, store clerks, but all of them elected representatives of their local communities. And they meet in Montpelier to govern. Join me now as Adelphia Cable Communications takes us inside the State House. Talking now with Senator William Doyle. Senator Doyle is, the, of course, the author of the famous Doyle Poll, which we see each year at Town Meeting Day. And Senator Doyle has uh, the results calculated from the, this year's poll. Before we go into the results, though, Senator Doyle, maybe you could tell us how many towns were involved and uh, responded to your poll? How many voters' uh, responses do you have? Well, Bruce, this is a preliminary survey, 78 towns and all of Vermont's 14 counties. By the time we're done, we'll have um, 140 towns and probably 13 or 14,000 replies. This is 8,500 replies, but generally by the time you get to 8,500, the percentages don't change that much. 8,500 respondents to this poll, uh, typically a, a good, well-laid-out poll. How many responses would they look for to, to validate their uh, answers? If you're polling in Vermont, in a scientific poll, you usually have 500 responses. 500 and you have 8,500? 8,500. 8, and Professor Tom Rice at the University of Vermont has indicated that when we've both asked the same question, we're within a few percentage points of, the, of each other. Well, let's look at some of the responses here. What are some of the more lopsided uh, votes? Some of them are, are very narrow, but some of them are very lopsided. The most uh, lopsided, Bruce, is uh, should uh, Vermont's bail laws be strengthened? And 80% said yes, 6% said no, and 14% uh, were undecided. This is an issue that the legislature has taken up. The Senate, as a matter of fact, has taken up this issue, haven't they? And, ha and has passed it, and is now sending it on to the House. Something to do with the responses to these polls, or just a, a general sense of what the responses, what the public's response to strengthening bail laws is? Well, the poll responses were mentioned by Senator Carroll on the floor of the Senate, uh, but I think most people uh, would have voted that way whether they saw the poll or not, because legislators generally know there's very strong support to strengthen our bail laws. Another issue that I know has been on the uh, Senate floor is back in the uh, Senate Natural Resources Committee, and that is the banning of styrofoam cups. And I see that you have a question regarding that on your poll. 76% say yes, 18% say no, and 6% are undecided. That's a very strong message to ban the styrofoam. And the, I, I predict that the uh, styrofoam will be banned, at least in the Senate, and uh, probably uh, be enacted into law this year. There have been some very close votes, uh, so far unable to pass that. How have you voted on that particular bill, and uh, where do you see the motion now, now that it's back in committee? Will it come back to the floor? How will you vote on it? I voted for the ban originally. It was a sort of a narrow ban. Um, when it comes back on the floor, it will cover more uh, styrofoam. It will be a broader coverage bill. And again, I'll support the uh, ban, and I think you'll probably have 19 or 20 votes for the ban. The poll may have some influence on that vote, too, or maybe not? Well, it, it can't hurt. Uh, obviously, legislators uh, listen to testimony in committee. They listen to committee reports on the floor of the House and the Senate. But I think they also want to know what, how the people back home feel about the strong issues. And when your district feels very strongly about an issue, I think that that message uh, comes through. Another, the third one that has a real lopsided uh, percentages to it is the one regarding uh, Regional Planning Commission's authority to veto town plans, or in other words, Act 200. Maybe you could tell us uh, what you think the sentiment there is and what effect that will have on uh, your, your uh, House's actions this year. Well, the uh, survey shows a strong dissatisfaction with Act 200 as it is now written, and I would predict uh, that the veto will be taken out uh, because it's the pot, there's not very much popular support. Only 16% support the veto that uh, a regional commission can veto or disapprove of a local plan. There's been some attempt in the uh, Senate Natural Resources Committee again to, to vote a bill out, but they're unhappy with what they have or afraid of what will happen. The House has begun talking that if they don't get something from the Senate pretty quick, they're going to produce one of their own. What, what do you see as the next step here in, in terms of dealing with Act 200? Bruce, the Senate will take it up. There'll be an extended floor debate, and uh, the veto will either be completely removed or partially removed as a result of the Senate action. Thank you, Senator Doyle. It's been good talking with you.
Thank you, Bruce. Talking now with Representative Matt Krause about another tax proposal. This one, a tax on unemployment compensation that's in the House Appropriations Committee. Matt, maybe you can tell us the intention of the bill and where you stand on it. Hey, Bruce, what the bill is, it's House number 882. The bill is a surcharge as far as, as far as unemployment compensation is concerned. It's an additional tax to employers, and what it would require is that an employer pay an additional 0.07 of their wages to the unemployment compensation fund for the administering of unemployment compensation in the state of Vermont. And what that means is it means that employers are going to be pay, have to pay additional uh, costs to make sure that the unemployment compensation and job service offices stay open. And I think that employers are rather concerned about the cost involved in this and they're also concerned about uh, double taxation that they've already paid into the fund and that they don't wish to pay any additional fees at this point. If this is a tight budgetary year. We're looking at uh, multi-million dollar surpluses. Is this another e effort just to raise uh, taxes? And if so, how much are we looking at? How much could this bill raise? This bill is expected to raise between $800,000 and $1 million per year. I think employers are a little bit concerned that the uh, additional costs that they would have to bear this year is, <coughs> is unfair and that they aren't able to pay those additional costs. As I'm sure you're aware, the, the economy has taken a downturn and the amount of money available for expansion for new products and additional employees is limited. This tax is going to take money out and it's not going to make it available for that expansion. Employers are not happy about this tax. and. Uh, I think we'll see that when it comes time to the for a floor vote. Uh, it's impossible to know ahead of time. What do you predict in terms of a floor vote, though? I believe that uh, when it comes, when the merits of the bill are discussed, I believe that uh, the um, House will vote this bill down. I believe that it's a uh, taxation that's unnecessary. Uh, the Department of Employment and Training has always been fully funded by the federal government. I think there's sufficient money available to make sure that the services are available, and I think what. I think with a little better management, perhaps, of the money that they're available, they can provide the same service without taxing the employers an additional 800000 to $1 million. In the event that it were a close vote and uh, some of the viewers wanted to influence their legislators one way or another on this bill, how would they get a hold of their legislators here in Montpelier? Okay, the first thing they can do, obviously, is a phone call to the Sergeant at Arms at 828-2228. And uh, we are handed messages all the time. We step off the floor for a few moments, make those uh, phone calls, and call the individuals up. The second way to do it is to contact them either at their home numbers, or the third manner is to simply send a short note indicating what the bill is and where they stand. In other words, if they're unhappy about a particular bill, state the bill's number, their opposition to it, and tell them uh, that they simply wish to speak with their legislator concerning this. If you do not take those steps, or an employer or an individual does not, then really you have no uh, recourse to come back to a legislator later on and say, I was opposed to that bill, why didn't you vote against it? Probably the easiest way then, Matt, is to call the Sergeant at Arms office. That way you can get uh, a hold of all your senators, legislators, all with one number. What was that number again? It's 828-2228, and I can assure you if uh, I get a phone call from a constituent in uh, Berry City, I'll make a, a return phone call within a few moments, and I don't think you'll find a single legislator who wouldn't do that uh, rather quickly. Thank you, Representative Matt Krause. We're in the lobby of the State House talking with a lobbyist, talking with Sherry Russell. Sherry, maybe you could tell the viewers uh, who it is that you lobby for and what are some of the efforts that you're working on. I work for the Vermont Farm Bureau organization, so I work for farmers, and that means I work on farm issues. Some of the programs, some of the bills we've been working on this year, uh, let's see, one is called H-492, which would have implemented a summer study committee to figure out some a better way to incorporate agriculture into the school curriculum. Um, it was a really good bill. It had no money attached to it, and there were a lot of very good people ready to jump on board and volunteer their time and, and work on this bill. And I have to admit I'm a little upset right now because the Appropriations Committee voted it down yesterday by a margin of five to four. Um, it's a very close vote, and, and I understand there was no appropriation attached to it. What was the opposition? I don't think they understood the bill. I think that there were some, there were some revenge type feelings going on there of people that uh, were upset about something else and voted it down just for that reason. Um, 
there were well to continue they said that they don't think they, that they don't think there was a need for that bill that that study committee could have happened anyway but that's not true because it was made up of people from UVM extension the something called Ag in the Classroom which is a private group of people and then people from Department of Agriculture in the state of Vermont were willing to work with it but you needed a bill like this from the legislature to pull all those people together thing, Sherry, that you've been working on is this BST. Maybe you can tell us about uh, where the two sides of this uh, debate stand. Well, that was a really tough one um, it, because I think that maybe a lot of us people who understand farm issues would have rather not made that an issue at all this year. It was it was debated last year, and there was a um, a resolution was passed saying that Vermont. Um, I forget, I wasn't here last year, but we, we passed a non-binding resolution um, saying that we approved of the federal government taking a closer look at BST. But that was really would have been enough on the state level. But then what happened is during the Berry Farm Show, Governor Kunin, uh, during her luncheon speech, said that she was going to call on the House, the Vermont legislature to ban BST in Vermont. So that put everybody in an awkward position because we're trying to build coalitions among farmers. We don't want any fighting amongst farmers, but but with the BST, there's a lot. There's about 50-50 who feel one way, and you know it, it's going to cause a, a little debate if you try to bring it up. So she called on the legislature to ban it. That meant that Bobby, Representative Bobby Starr, who's chairman of the House Ag Committee, had to do something with it and. And, of course, he doesn't like the idea of BST anyway, so he was happy to put out a bill that would, would ban it in the state. The problem is that he couldn't get a lot of widespread support from farmers to just outright ban it. So what he did come up with is a bill that everybody could sign on to, including my organization, the Farm Bureau. It's a bill that would appoint a, a study committee, a five-member panel, that could spend up to 60 days reviewing the data from FDA and then would have the authority to decide whether or not to approve BST in the state of Vermont. And they're only going to look at animal and human health issues. So we're keeping this a very scientific study, and we've taken all the emotional aspects out of it. I'm gathering from what you're saying, Sherry, that you'd probably, the farmers probably would have uh, been just as happy if Governor Kuhn had just left the thing alone. Right, exactly. Which I have to admit that we also were upset because she had a lot of us key farm people in her conference room the night before. Um, she wanted to share with us facts about the budget. Uh, it was like, okay, here's, here's all you important farm people, and here's the budget, and this is where we're going to propose some cuts. And, you know, I just wanted to bring you all in here so that we could talk about this in this nice private setting. And she never mentioned that on the very next day she was going to propose a moratorium on BST. And that upset a lot of people because if, if she had only shared her confidence with us in that setting, they would have felt a lot different about it, I think. Sure, I know one of the other things that you must be working on because it's a directly farm-related issue is the current tax use uh, program. The, uh, there's been some conflict and it's kind of put the uh, education pitted against the, the farmers, kind of a controversial set up here. Maybe you could comment on that. Well, I wouldn't say that we're pitting education against farmers. Uh, I, I would say that everybody in Vermont is sharing a huge property tax burden right now with escalating costs of education. And we've tried to help keep farmers in Vermont farming through a current use program, which I think is very fair. It means that anyone who lives, lives and works on a farm is going to pay full taxes on their house and two acres. You know, and everybody across the state has to do that. They have to kick in their share towards municipal and, and school costs. But with given the economics of farming today, we've also set up this what we call current use taxation program, which means that uh, they do get a tax break on their agricultural land and buildings. Um, and it's been, it has turned a little controversial this year because uh, the under the current use program, there's something called working farm tax abatement, which went even further and granted further savings on that land and buildings. Uh, but being a new program, only two years old, right now with a huge deficit in the state, it's been real vulnerable to um, spending cuts. And 
at first we, um, not, not, not myself, but people who understand the program and work with it in the tax department, told appropriations that they could easily give up $850,000 from the program. It's, it's roughly a $12 million program. And they said, okay, well, we don't need this 850. You can have that. Okay, so we did our bit to help balance the budget. But then the Appropriations Committee wanted to go even further and eliminate another $2 million from the program, which would have basically killed working farm tax abatement. And like I said, it's a new program. It's only two years old. It was passed as part of the whole Act 200 bill. So it was vulnerable as, as a new program. And, and we've had to try to fight to maintain the funding for that. Uh, the way we, we did that, which Chairman Representative Starr did, was he made an amendment, well, along with Representative Francis Brooks, they amended the appropriations bill by adding 1.9 million back into the budget. And they had to find a source for that 1.9 million, and they, they targeted the uh, retirement funds, which is both state employee and teacher retirement funds. So that was pretty controversial, and it generated a two-hour debate on the floor. And the, we, we won that, agriculture won the, uh, the, the vote on that by uh, 72 to 61, I believe it was. It was a pretty close vote. But the way that um, Representative Starr explained it to the, to the body of the House was that we only need to borrow this money for a couple days, he said, because we have this bill called H-181 that's sitting in Ways and Means, which it, we're calling it, I'm really excited about this, we're calling it a, a tourism an agriculture marriage or partnership and the the key people the leaders in the travel industry the tourism industry have signed on to this bill H181 and they what we want to do is add another 1% to rooms and meals right now Vermont is at 6% and for example New Hampshire is at 7% so we're not going to uh, drive t tourists away if we go up another 1% and what we want to do with that money, that it would be, it would generate a close to seven million dollars in '91, and we wanted to target that money with 25 percent of it to go to additional travel promotion, and 75 percent would support the working farm tax abatement program. And what that means in dollars is 1.75 million for travel, and 4.9 million for the working farm tax abatement program. Uh, it's the bill passed out of the Commerce Committee, which is where it originated, by a unanimous vote of 11-0. Um, so it had full support from Commerce. It went over to Ways and Means, and the chairman didn't like it. The vice chairman didn't like it. They're just sitting there holding on to it, and we can't seem to get them to move on it. So I believe something else, we may come up with a plan B on that to still try to get that out. Getting back to the idea of the controversy, the pitting of the education against the farms, I guess that was the, the aspect of raiding the teacher's retirement fund where they got into controversy. Right. What about, uh, Sherry, what about the idea, now you represent farmers. Some people have uh, said that uh, farmers can represent themselves here. There's enough uh, farmers in the legislature that uh, they have their own will and way. But well, you've hit a very sensitive spot for me because there's been an awful lot of uh, press lately, um, specifically one reporter who's come out with at least three different stories about the uh, tax abatement program and and the way she keeps wording it is she's calling it a tax shelter and she, one of her uh, sentences said that she listed all the legislators who get a certain amount of a tax abated and but instead of calling it abatement she just said they get this amount and she would say like they get seven thousand dollars well they don't get seven thousand they get seven thousand abated you know a, a reduction on their taxes but they still pay something like four thousand dollars that's why i'm here working for farmers i think it's very unfair that people have to work seven days a week sixty hours a day they've got a high amount of money invested in land and they could be doing something else and making more money. And I think people have to decide whether or not they want to have farming in Vermont. Do they want to have a good source of food close to home? And are they willing to put a little bit of money into some programs that are going to keep these farmers on the land versus selling out to development and getting rich quick? 
One person, one vote. It's a basic principle of our democracy. We each want to be sure that our vote counts every time we go to the polls. That's where the 1990 census can help. Yes, the census. When we count everybody in Vermont, we're making sure that we get fair representation in the Senate and House of Representatives. So answer the census. It counts for more than you think. This message brought to you by the Office of the Vermont Secretary of State and Adelphia Cable. Talking now with Senator Reedy here in the lobby of the State House, and uh, she's relating to me, or we've been uh, conversing about the difficulty that is. Sometimes it's real tough, isn't it, to decide how to vote on some issues? I think that sometimes you have competing interests, and you really have to look deeply at the issues and see what is really in the best interest of the people of the state. So. I've, I've watched some of the debates, and it seems like both sides have good arguments. Uh, more than once, I've been thankful that I don't have to vote. Well, I think that's true. And you just have to really listen. For example, last week when we dealt with the bail bill uh, and we changed the definition of aggravated sexual assault, on the one hand, we were we were weighing the interests of um, women who may have been assaulted and brutally injured against the rights that um, all people have to due process and, and to freedom under the Constitution and to being innocent until proven guilty. And that was one of the most difficult ones for me personally. Uh, where you really, really had uh, to look at the Constitution, to look at the bill before us, and to look at the interests of both parties. And that's a very difficult emotional issue as well. When you have such uh, a crime sweeping the state, uh, and yet you want to always remember the rights of, uh, of all individuals. One of the bills that I know uh, you have less trouble deciding on is the bill that would ban uh, polystyrofoam. Uh, maybe you can tell us uh, why it is that you're so persuaded uh, for one side of that issue. Well, basically, uh, what what I did in making my decision about that bill is weigh the benefit of the product against uh, the detriments to the environment and to human health. And when you look at the benefit of holding a polystyrene burger container in your hands for a few seconds to keep your burger warm, and you weigh it against the environmental impacts, that is, the production of hazardous waste, the use of chlorofluorocarbons that deplete the ozone, the litter issue, where we have litter, uh, polystyrene litter along our rivers and streams, along our roadsides that our animals are, are eating and, and harmed by, and then the solid waste issue. So when you take those four areas and you weigh it against uh, the use of this product, I just have to come down very firmly in favor of protecting the health and safety and protecting the environment. So some issues are easily decided and some uh, it's a real battle. Of oh, you bring your own values to it, you listen to what the public is saying, you weigh all the facts and then you try to make a decision. Talking now with Michael Bender. Michael, maybe you can tell us uh, your title and why it is that you're at the State House. So my name is uh, Michael Bender. I'm the Solid Waste Planner at Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, and uh, I'm here today to urge passage of the uh, bill to ban polystyrene packaging in food restaurants. And uh, one of the main reasons is because uh, uh, we can't uh, can't recycle polystyrene in an economically viable fashion out of our recycling depots. Uh, the, the high volume, uh, low density of the material uh, leads for expensive trucking costs and the only place that we can bring these materials currently is to Massachusetts. Michael, apparently uh, the bill that's in the Senate uh, Natural Resources Committee has been labeled by many as an anti-McDonald's bill. McDonald's being one of the largest users of the styrofoam and yet McDonald's is uh, recycling styrofoam. So why the opposition? Well, part of the opposition is is uh, due to, again, the high trucking costs. And uh, if McDonald's is willing to pick up polystyrene from all the recycling uh, depots uh, in, in our region, then uh, we we'd be more apt to consider their uh, taking their recycling uh, initiative seriously. But at this point, um, restaurants only uh, produce about one third of the polystyrene in the state and, and a good percentage of that is uh, uh, taken out by the very nature of McDonald's, it's a takeout. So most of the material is being taken out. So that leaves two thirds of it not in restaurant use and even of the third that's in restaurant use, it's not all McDonald's. And even what's McDonald's, it's not all in the the restaurant, but it's some take up. Any idea what proportion of uh, styrofoam is actually recycled in the state of Vermont? Uh, 
only a small percentage by McDonald's at, at this point. And, and in terms of, of getting to 40% uh, recycling by the year 2000, I, I, that's a question in my mind that we have from a uh, recycling standpoint. Overall, talking about overall recycling, not just the fast food restaurants. Thank you, Mr. Bender. Welcome. Talking now, not with a legislator, but with the executive director of Vermont's Bicentennial Commission, Carolyn Mew. Carolyn, what are you doing in the State House today? Is there anyone that uh, you want to talk with or some issue that you're working on or just visiting? Well, um, I was actually having lunch. My office is across the street, but I had an opportunity to visit with the vice chairman of the Bicentennial Commission, who is a legislator, Bill Mayers, and we were just talking about various is issues, um, the license plate, which the commission will be um, selling shortly, and a few other matters, just to update them. Representative Mayers, he's a real fireball for when it comes to bicentennial issues, isn't he? Oh, he's Mr. Bicentennial. He is such a, such a joy and a pleasure to work with him. His energy, his love level of commitment. Um, he's an inspiration to me, so um, he's, he's fun to work with. I know you, so you have the Bicentennial Plates coming up. Uh, I know folks are looking forward to that. One of the other things that I've found are really exciting to follow is your secession debates. Where do you stand? I know there's some voting that goes along with that. Um, we have completed six of the seven scheduled um, secession debates featuring Frank Bryan, the UVF professor, and John Dooley, the, uh, a Supreme Court justice and the vote is is coming in and it is to secede from the union it's about 640 to 370 in favor of secession not a real viable option though is it or is it well you talk to Frank Bryan on that um, what it means for the Commission is that people are out there talking about and discussing the meaning of statehood and what it means to be a state um, through a um, different color glass than we normally look at statehood and because people are thinking and talking it's been a tremendous success just in that because it's elevated the the level of discussion on the meaning of statehood you're wearing a very handsome pin the bicentennial official bicentennial pin is there uh, some place that people could get those and and the other bicentennially endorsed items if they're looking for those? Yes, the Commission has licensed the use of the, the logo for commemorative products and um, we have a gift directory that we can be um, acquired. We can send it from our Rutland office. You can call the Rutland office at 775-0800 or write requesting a gift directory at P.O. Box 6833 in Rutland. It looks like Vermont has a very exciting birthday or bicentennial year coming up then, Carolyn. If there's someone viewing who wants to be involved and participate, how can they get involved in this bicentennial celebration? Oh, that's easy. Um, to date, we have 135 communities which have set up official bicentennial com um, committees. And really what's happening, the exciting things are happening at a local level. And I would recommend um, any viewer that's interested is to get in touch with their um, local committee. And if they're not sure if their community has a committee or don't, they don't know who the chairman is, to contact the state office, which is in Rutland. Again, the number is 775-0800, and we will tell them who to get in touch with. And it's, it's really exciting and a lot of wonderful different things happening at the community level. Thank you, Carolyn Mupe. And for